G'day everyone, I'm Ebony Bennett, Deputy Director at the Australia Institute and welcome to Poll Position and our last one for the year with Guardian Australia and Essential Media where we cover the latest results from the Guardian Essential Poll. Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge that I live and work on Ngunnawal and Ngambri country and pay my respects to Elders past and present and note today the very sad news that um, the Adani company seems to have uh, once again blown up artifacts uh, of traditional owners on country. Um, so there's, I think, a good story. I think it's already up on The Guardian, uh, Catherine, correct me if I'm wrong, but while we're acknowledging traditional owners, I just thought uh, important to point out what's still going on, despite uh, a lot of outrage uh, around the Duke and Caves issue um, not so many months ago. The days and times for our webinars do vary, but I'm not going to go into that this week because it is our last one for the year, but we will have more great webinars coming up next year and of course more great poll positions. Just a few quick tips before we begin to help things run smoothly today. If you hover over the bottom of your Zoom screen, you should be able to see a Q&A button where you can type in questions for our panel and upvote and make comments on other people's questions as well. A reminder to please keep things civil and on topic in the chat or we'll boot you out. And last a reminder that this discussion is being recorded and it does go up on the Australia Institute's YouTube page and on our website after the discussion. So Poll Position is our show where we unpack the big political issues and dive into the latest political polling trends. And thank you so much, audience, for being along for the ride this year. It's been another massive year in politics. I particularly want to thank everyone that came over from Australia at home to the new home here at the Australia Institute. And uh, given the, the massive couple of weeks we've had um, just in the last couple of weeks, I'm not quite sure how we're going to cover the entire year. But we'll uh, we'll give it a bit of a crack, and I'm delighted to welcome back our regular panelists, Catherine Murphy, political editor at Guardian Australia, and Pete Lewis, director at executive director at Essential Media. Um, John Remington normally joins us, uh, but he can't today, and he will be missed. Um, but thank you so much for joining us, Catherine. Before we kind of go to the full year in review. A lot happening just in the last couple of weeks, just in Parliament alone and the behaviour kind of that we saw there, but a big um, report about the treatment of women and sexual harassment and bullying in Parliament, um, quite a number of things happening um, as per usual, I guess. <laughs> well, well, sort of, yes, as per usual, the final couple of sitting weeks are often chaotic. If people watch politics closely, they'll know that is often sort of desperate arm twisting and scrambles to the finish as governments try and get their remaining legislation through. But certainly over the past two weeks, I, I think it was uh, Scott Morrison's worst uh, sort of period, sustained two week period since uh, the bushfires at, at the end of 2019, 2020. It's still, <laughs> it's still hard to find words actually for what happened in the last couple of weeks, um, uh, the Prime Minister was facing in insurrections on multiple fronts. He had a couple of Liberal senators on strike who wouldn't support any government legislation, which is kind of tricky if you're trying to get your remaining things through. And that was over the vaccine mandates. They were kind of holding their votes on everything because of vaccine mandates. Yes, that's basically right. So um, they wanted Scott Morrison to do something about uh, vaccination mandates, largely but not exclusively imposed by the states. Then in uh, the lower house, we had uh, other insurrections. We had Bridget Archer, who is a, rep a liberal who represents uh, the marginal seat of Bass in Tasmania across the floor to support Helen Haynes, the independent, Victorian independent, who was attempting to bring on a debate about an integrity commission. Uh, that was sort of quite, uh, quite a significant uh, gesture, uh, I think, in terms of um, where the moderates are lining up on key debates. And speaking of moderates, uh, the moderates also slowed down uh, the, the whole process of deliberations around the government's religious discrimination package. Uh, and basically a handful of them uh, refused really to support it through a lower house vote because they were concerned about the impact on gay students and teachers. 
So, look, the Prime Minister really did want that package passed by the lower house in the final sitting week of the Parliament. It was, uh, you could see him sort of um, lining up an argument that uh, Labor had, uh, you know, Labor had refused to pass this package or was slowing it down or, or whatever else. But in the end, it was his own people uh, that uh, subjected that to, uh, you know, just, just basically wanted enhancements that weren't in the bill. There are other bits and pieces too, uh, but as you said, uh, Ed, you know, the real sort of thunderclap of last week was the Jenkins report, which uh, was long anticipated. This is the report um, that the government commissioned from Australia's Sex Discrimination Commissioner after the former Liberal staffer, Brittany Higgins, uh, alleged that she had been raped in a ministerial office uh, in March 2019. I hope that's right. Um, Anyway, yes, this uh, report landed. It was about as bad as uh, you would have thought it would be. Uh, it showed basically that um, Parliament House has got significant uh, cultural problems as, as a workplace, uh, high incidents of sexual harassment, bullying, other things. Uh, there, it contains sort of vignettes of first person testimony. There were many hundreds of submissions and interviews. For full disclosure, I should tell the audience that I was also interviewed for the Jenkins Review. Um, anyway, so that sort of landed like a thunderclap. Uh, and on the day that report landed, I don't know why the parliament took it into its head in both chambers to put on the most sort of, uh, you know, off display of, um, you know, random testosterone that you would find uh, on any given sitting day of the parliament. It was really appalling, the atmospherics sort of around the release of the report. And uh, the prime minister was very keen to convey the message that the, the, the culture and workplace problems in parliament house are an issue for all political parties. And he's correct that, that they are an issue for all political parties. But again, I think that that report gave the Prime Minister an opportunity to, to show some leadership. Uh, this cultural reckoning, reckoning has occurred on his watch. Uh, and he was so keen, I think, to apportion responsibility that he conveyed the impression that really no one was in charge of, of cleaning up uh, in the wake of it. So again, that was a sort of unfortunate and discordant note. So yeah, it was quite a lively fortnight. Yeah, kind of consistent, I guess, with some of the other things that voters remember about, you know, it's not my job to do that particular thing, as you said, apportioning blame everywhere, misses that opportunity to say, well, it's landed on my watch and here's what I'm going to do, you know, to fix yeah. it. Yeah. Uh, I've got a comment here from Bev Mudja, who says the last fortnight has felt like six months. <laughs> what that makes you feel like Bev but I think we're all probably in agreement on that I think and we're it, with you Bev just quietly I think yeah and it you. really did strike me um that the biggest issues for the Prime Minister in the last couple of sitting weeks was his own backbench um but Pete <clears throat> moving to the polling um I was quite struck by the Guardian Essential poll this week um around the issues of uh, corruption and integrity in politics. And that's what your column is about today. People can check that out on Guardian Australia. Um, just about how, I guess, all the noxiousness that uh, Catherine was talking about in the parliament helps contribute to, I guess, a bit of a miasma of um, contempt for parliament for facts for information expertise a bit of yeah a, in the in the populace yeah i found this a little bit disheartening actually we we asked people often there's questions about trust in institutions we want to ask about the trust in um the information people receive and um it's in the slides later i, I don't know if you need to shuffle it through but we, the, the, the short version was you know while we're sort of I think over the last couple of years thought we've reasserted our faith in government and we got through the pandemic. We've got over 50% of people saying they don't trust what comes out of government. We've got similar numbers saying they don't trust what comes out of the media or any of the, the, the peak bodies that are involved in the public discourse. And then you get the digital platforms where it's just like 19% of people yeah. um, saying that they don't trust it. And it just feels to me that as we're leading into election season, 
we are not going to be having these debates on solid ground. And it, I think it feeds into so much of the challenges we see, everything from climate change to vaccine hesitancy to campaigns that are run on um, tropes and cliches rather than on actual policy. And so as we see the political parties start to engage, are we going to have an election where no one really trusts the information they're getting and the whole show is going to be about pushing for emotional reactions or is there an opportunity to, to do something different? And I just don't have a lot of, I don't know, it might be just the end of a long year, but it doesn't lead me with a huge amount of faith that um, it's going to be a very, um, you know, principled or um, particularly edifying experience, this election <laughs> campaign. And I know in one corner we've got, um, you know, a guy who's um, very good at the photo op um, and he's been sort of spending a fair bit of time running away from accountability. On the other side, we've got, in a way, a, an opposition that's trying to portray itself as being less than it really wants to be because effectively there's a bit of a fear of the electorate and a fear of the... Um, the ability of that, that ecosystem of incumbent government, media and social media to create these whirlwinds of, of fear and loathing around what we used to call considered progressive policy. So um, I know the climate um, uh, policy was announced on, the, on Friday. I know that the um, skills policy was announced on the weekend. It'd be great to have a debate on whether they're good ideas rather than whether you can turn them into a cartoon that's going to scare you. But, you know, I don't know, maybe it's just the end of a long year, but um, probably was a more sanguine column than I'm used, I'm used to writing. Yeah, we might come back to the slides in just a minute. But yeah, yeah. Um, I did want to ask you about Labor's um, climate policy coming out. Um, obviously, we had the government's uh, policy, uh, well, not that anything really changed, and it publicly released its modelling ahead of, was it ahead of Glasgow or after? I can't remember. Yeah, it was ahead. Yeah, it was ahead. And, yeah. um, and we've got Labor's now. Where does Labor sit in comparison uh, on climate change to what the government is proposing? Yeah, well, this is a big policy from Labor. Um, I think it just, just a couple of uh, points of preamble, Ed. Um, it, it's sort of commonly thought that Labor hasn't released any policy really at all. Um, under Anthony, Anthony, Alban, Anthony Albanese, sorry, having trouble speaking for some reason, uh, under Anthony Albanese's leadership, uh, there, there is a common perception that there's no policy out there. That's not quite right. There's actually a bit more out there than people realise. But certainly with the climate uh, policy, this is this is the most significant, in, in my view, not, not, just, uh, not just because I'm obsessed with this subject as regular viewers know, but I think electorally and substantively, this is the most uh, risky a policy that Albanese has put up in his period of leadership, just in terms of the, the sort of blasted earth of climate politics in Australia. In terms of the substance, Ed, well, uh, the, the opposition has resolved to pursue a, a 2030 emissions reduction target of 43%. That is lower than the 45% that they took to the 2019 election. But uh, it's, it's a number that they are confident they can deliver uh, based on some accompanying economic analysis by uh, the climate analytics firm Reputex. They're, they're, they're very skilled in this area, Reputex. Um, in the area of sort of carbon market dynamics and other things. So uh, they think 43% is sort of not stepping off ambition, uh, but, but it is nonetheless manageable on with some not minor adjustments, they're actually significant adjustments to existing policy mechanisms, namely the safeguards mechanism. Now, I'm not going to bore everybody witless by explaining the safeguard mechanism, but basically it's, it's a system that's supposed to constrain industrial pollution at the moment. It doesn't. Uh, what Labor's uh, trying, proposing to do is make it constrain industrial pollution, right? Um, so th there's there are basically some uh, some tweaks that will be uh, imposed to the existing mechanism. Now, 
what is 43%? Well, obviously the science tells us that should it should be a stronger target. The science is quite clear, 40, 43% is not sufficient, but it's, but it's also, uh, it is credible. The policy offering that they've put forward uh, is, you know, here's our target, here's our mechanisms, here's what a, a reputable firm tells us by way of uh, what the economic consequences of these policies are. And they have set about selling it. Uh, now, um, I know there'll be a whole lot of progressive people who are disappointed by that target, uh, but I think it's the, the limits. It, re it reflects a, judgments, a judgment about the limits um, that they can push the whole climate ambition envelope, given what happened in 2019. And it is accompanied by data, which leads one to conclude that it's not total rubbish. So it's sort of like, in terms of the, the, the major party position at the moment, we've got the government that has a, has a, a label for its policy, technology, not taxes. Uh, but, uh, you know, I would describe that offering as very thin. Uh, we have the Labor Party, look, it, it, the, again, the word I would use about that, the policy is credible. It is credible. It's, it's not as ambitious as a lot of people would like, uh, but there is actually a target and a series of steps that one, you know, can imagine leading to that target, whereas that's the big sort of gap on the government side is the government has sort of plugged into a net zero target okay. for 2050. They've gone to their policy and then they've asked for a analysis of what that policy will deliver. So in a way, we know that people love the idea of renewables. They love the idea of electric vehicles. They love the idea of community batteries and local renewable networks. So from what I can understand, they've started with that and said, so what's that going to deliver over the next, you know, five to 10 years? So they're not defend. And I think Labor's always fallen to the gap of almost falling for the long-term target and then being attacked on what it's going to mean, whereas they've actually nailed what it's going to mean and then just arrived on a target based on that. Yeah, well, it's much more 20. The, the, the primary point of contra uh, contrast now is that Labor has a 2030 roadmap, whereas the government doesn't really have a have a defined um, 2030 roadmap. So, mm -hmm. yeah. I can see we've got about 750 people on with us today. Thanks so much for joining us. We have just been covering the kind of last couple of weeks in politics and we haven't really got to the slides yet even, but um, we might come back a little bit later to a bit more of a wrap up of the year. And if I go um, to the slides now, uh, we might go back to the start. Uh, <laughs> Why not? Pete. Three, two, there we go. Yeah, no, there you go. Here we go. Um, this squiggly line is the journey of public support for federal government um, handling of the only real big show in town for the last two years, the pandemic. Um, as you can see, the government ends the year in a slightly uptick from where they were a few weeks ago. I think that combined is 47 majority support. As people can see at the start of the year, it was much closer to 60, 70. The light blue line is quite good. The dark blue line is very good. So at the moment, it's 14% very good. A third, 33% quite good. Um, what happened this year, as you can see that little slippery slide, that's when the vaccine rollout started to run off the rails. And then the lockdowns occurred and um, the faith in the government's performance that peaked at 31, very good, and another 10, you know, another 30-odd, quite good, has totally disappeared. State-by-state um, state figures, I was interested in the uptick in federal government support in both Queensland and Victoria. That had been trending, obviously, look at Queensland at the start of the year, 78% down to 40% by mid-year, back up to 50 there. Again, it shows that the story, like the, th those lines do kind of reflect each other a little bit, but um, it is really going to be a story of different states. And we'll also see then the relative performance of state governments in the next one, Ebony. So um, New South Wales is stabilised after lockdown, Victoria's likewise. Whereas in Queensland, the states that are in lockdown are sort of the regard for the state government is now, well, not, sorry, not lockdown, but with still borders closed. It's a little bit of a different story. Um, that peak of 91% in WA was quite, 
quite remarkable. It's still at 74. At one stage, they put out an all people's alert to find the one person in WA who wasn't <laughs> voting for McGowan. But I think found a couple more. I think they've got three MPs over there now. Um, so the story of the year is really that it was a really tough year for everyone. Their regard for government fell. We're kind of at the end of the year and we're taking a big breath. Of course, we've got Omicron in now, and I still can't say it properly. A few questions around that. This first one, um, how do you think governments and health authorities should react to the new variant? Um, majority is a bit of a wait and see. Um, 49%, you got a 16% saying under no conditions, um, are we going to change any of the requirements or restrictions? And there's 34% of people wanting to go hard early. I guess the fault line is between that 34 and 49% at the moment, even though all the noise is coming from the 16% bar chart. Yeah, but it does strike me that perhaps that middle bit is um, a lot bigger than it might have otherwise been because we've most people are double vax now, so presumably mm. we feel a bit more comfortable um, or a bit more protected. Yeah, a number of these shows that instinct that Australia really wanted to lock down on everything is kind of starting to relax. This one you've got a leaning close to read as I do. Um, and these were a series of statements around controlling the spread of COVID. Um, so, so the it's clear at the top there is that um, 61% in total agree that it should be compulsory for all adults to be vaccinated against COVID-19 unless they have a medical exemption. So strong majority there, even though... But the, that number's up to 20% disagreeing there, which is more than are unvaccinated. Um, so that interests me. Um, and that number, the government should never impose lockdowns again, no matter what. 28% um, is now in that camp. There's still half of us saying, well, if we need to, we need to. Um, and the government should consider shortening the time before a person can receive their COVID-19 booster. Third jab, yeah, about 40% of people up for that. Um, and we might come back out to a chat just a, in a second. But yeah. the Have a look at that bottom line on that one. That's the one yeah. that stood out to me. So that's um, unvaccinated people should be required to pay for any hospital costs if they require medical attention as a result of contracting COVID-19. Total support, 55%. That's a bit cruel. <laughs> well, you know, we have created um, a, new, a new fault line in politics between the vaccinated and the unvaccinated. And um, the unvaccinated are a small minority, but um, there is there are divisions. Um, the country is not united when um, one of the key divisions is based on a personal choice. Yeah. Catherine, um, it is been, it has, COVID-19 has been obviously the big story of the past two years. And at one point, as we could see in those polls, you know, governments on the whole were riding pretty high, mm. pretty consistent trust, but that picture has muddied quite a bit mm. since then. Um, where do you think we'll find ourselves kind of of next year we've got a new variant um but people are a bit more all over the place than they were kind of at the beginning of the year yeah it's true people are a bit more all over the place and we and people's perceptions now reflect the sum of their lived experience which you know i guess shouldn't surprise us um and people i guess are more confident making judgments having been you know having lived through this over the last you know, two years, people think, well, yeah, I actually know something about a pandemic now. So, you know, I'm going to have views about it. Um, anyway, I'm not laughing at that. I think that's just perf perfectly rational. I think uh, the, the, those numbers suggest to me um, that there's still, um, you know, the sort of the, the I'll never get vaccinated and I don't want restrictions of any type ever. Uh, are still very much the minority in this country. There, there's nuance now along the curve about, like at the start, I remember Pete and I were reminiscing about this last week, that we asked a question at some stage in the pandemic, I think it was reasonably early on in year one, you know, sort of to what extent people would cope with uh, restrictions on their liberty. And I think we asked just as a sort of semi-lark, you know, would you wear an ankle bracelet at home? And, um, and we were astonished that a majority came back in support of this. Um, you know, we are... I think that was a home quarantine question, to be 
fair, but we were prepared to do it with all the bells and whistles was, of uh, um, a repressive regime. Yes, I think there was. Anyway, whatever. Um, obviously, we're not making light of this. Um, but all I'm saying is, you know, a couple of years ago. There was there there were very very strong absolute uh, majorities in favour of whatever public health restrictions necessary in order to suppress the curve of infections. That sort of that kind of centre of gravity is is moderated a bit over time, which again reflects people's lived experience. And I think it's interesting with this new variant. Um, again, there's a majority in favour of either let's just wait and see or let's be proactive not let's do nothing but again that center of gravity around let's oh, let's just weigh this up let's just see how that pans out that's that's interesting that's that's a shift in terms of where we wash up next year well i think we've just got to see really about this variant um hopefully um you know hopefully it's uh, the, the sort of early signs of it not being as severe in terms of the infection are right. Hopefully that's right, uh, because obviously we do have clusters of that variant in the community now. And, it, and it's silly to think that there won't be quite large numbers of infections associated with that variant. So I think it sort of depends, Eb, like, are we, are we starting to in terms of next year, it's sort of like where the collective psychology of the country ends up being, whether we're transiting from pandemic to endemic, i.e. this is getting, we're sort of on the journey to this being more like a bad flu than something that will, you know, has a high prospect of killing a, a number of people. Are we on that journey where it's starting to feel more manageable, difficult, but manageable? Or are we in uh, a, an environment where the variants are going to, you know, God forbid, be vac vaccination hesitant or, or va vaccine resistant and all of that sort of stuff? Well, then we're in a completely different ball game. So obviously I'm hoping it's the former, not the latter. Uh, I can see someone called John in the comments uh, saying that the Melbourne anti-vax mandate anti-dan pandemic bill protests are a mixture of almond milk latte drinkers and far right groups looking to recruit. Uh, I know that we've talked before about the security agencies warning about um, the far right using some of that anti-government sentiment, uh, sentiment to recruit. But um, just for something a bit lighter, the Australia Institute actually has looked into either the latte or Chardonnay sipping habits of Australians. And it's not always the political parties you might think. You can find that on our website. I think nationals uh, voters turn out to be the latte sippers of everyone. <laughs> and uh, most people like a, a Chardonnay as well. So there you go. Uh, that was a bit of fun research we did a few years back that comes up every now and again. Um, Catherine, um, I did want to come back to um, the Jenkins report and really just reflect on the huge year, particularly in Canberra, but also for the rest of Australia, that's really focused on, um, you know, we started the year with Grace Tame being Australian of the year, then we had the Brittany Higgins um, allegations that kind of really exploded in Parliament, but it seems to me um, there was a lot more focus and coverage on that for really the whole year compared to, I think it really did seem like a, a, um, a big turning point this year for those types of issues. But at the end of the year, it kind of, it didn't feel like much, um, that much had changed. Where do you think Parliament is at the very least? Yeah, it's sort of interesting, isn't it? Um, look, it, it's certainly true that... Uh, because of a number of catalysts and also because of an inclination of people to really stick at these stories. Um, we, I think there has been a clawing back of space in the cultural conversation for these issues. Uh, I do think there's been a, lo a lot of, you know, of ventilation of these issues over the last 12 months, you know, certainly more than I can remember in any recent times. Uh, but as you say, Eb, the critical question is what if anything's changed? Um, look, uh, in, the, in the parliament, uh, genuinely, I think there, have, there has been some change. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's slow and the whole, um, I, I confess that on the day the Jenkins report was released and uh, given 
the reaction that followed it, I felt genuinely repulsed to be in that building. And I've never had that that feeling so acutely before where I, I genuinely just didn't actually want to be there. Um, but despite those, <laughs> you know, those moments, uh, I do think there is some measurable progress in the building. Uh, there are support structures that used to be in place uh, before Brittany Higgins came forth with this story. I do honestly think it would be a very brave government not to take uh, the bulk of the Jenkins recommendations seriously, given they, they definitely want a cross-party process in order to try and deal with the workplace issues in Parliament House. So I think that, that gives it a little bit of um, surety around the fact that this will at least be taken seriously, whether or not all of the recommendations are implemented are, is another question. And of course, this government has uh, thus far not recommended the chief um, uh, proposal of Kate Jenkins in the respect of work report, which predated the parliament report, which is basically imposing a duty on employers to provide safe workplaces uh, where, where you know harassment is basically prohibited, mm. uh, the government has not implemented that. So you might uh, people on the on the webinar today might be saying, "Well, why are you optimistic?" And optimistic would be stretching where I am. Um, but I do think there has been progress to some degree. I do think in my conversations with parliamentarians, I think a bunch of these people for the first time are thinking about themselves as employers and managers of people. Uh, and I can guarantee I've been in the building more than two decades now, and I guarantee that most of these people have never thought of themselves as employers or managers of people. They've thought of themselves in very high pressure jobs that are make or break, and their staff are there to serve that serve that imperative, right? Yeah. Um, obviously, better that you know, there's a span of people. Not everybody's terrible, but I'm just saying the whole building is con configured around a different objective. So, you know, so, I mean, that's just the parliament. Of course, um, we can focus on the parliament and forget that actually the key battles, you know, need to be won, you know, in, in the legal structures and in other things that, that, that protect all people who are subject to sexual violence or harassment. There's a huge, there's a huge task uh involved in looking at all of those statutes and reforming them yeah and um, I think um Grace Tame has focused a lot on that in her year as an advocate um I was also going to mention I mean maybe it's just the time of year uh and then I had to think about it and I thought did think of some positive changes so I think not only are you right about parliament taking things seriously but Catherine you along with a lot of other women journalists senior ones in the press gallery I think really lifted that issue to be a national issue and not just one of the parliament. And I felt there was a real shift in the seriousness with which those allegations and the issue was taken this year. And a lot of that pushed by female journalists, not only, but it did seem to me a big shift in the response to that. And then of course, we've seen um, changes at the state level to affirmative consent laws in New South Wales as a result of the advocacy and activism of people like um, Saxon Mullins um, and the work of journalists like Nina Fennell uh, more broadly. So there is um, definitely um, some reasons to be hopeful. And certainly I think the allegations against um, Minister Tudge and him standing aside seems to me different treatment to yeah. how perhaps some other allegations were taken. Yeah, can I just, can I just, yeah. I don't know if it's a question or a, an observation. If the Prime Minister thought this was a really big political problem for him, would he have been at Mount Panorama fanging it around? Um, yeah. You know, you know, very fast car going, how good is driving fast on the weekend? Well, no, it's interesting, Pete. I was actually going to say something similar because uh, obviously the imagery is very telling. Um, and, you know, as we end the year, we've sort of got the Prime Minister kind of positioning himself at war with... Uh, the New South Wales integrity body and we've got him fanging around doing laps at Mount Panorama in a year that uh, where women have clawed back uh, cultural space in the conversation, both of which aren't particularly upbeat thoughts uh, to uh, console yourself with. 
But I do uh, wonder, though, at least with Mount Panorama, um, well, well, I'd say a couple of things. One, we can reach back into our own polling, Pete, to say, to observe that uh, in the wake of the Brittany Higgins allegation, the Prime Minister lost significant standing uh, among female voters. But uh, depressingly, uh, clawed back some support among some cohorts of male voters. So we've got to understand that when when cultural when, when when cultural space is clawed back to have a conversation, a lot of people standing back from all of this see this as a resumption of the gender wars, and then people tend to take mm. you know to take positions yeah. to basically arm up and take positions. So I guess we've got a query, you know. Did, you know, does the environment help the cause? Then in terms, but then, you know, my counterfactual or my, my observation on the other side of that, Pete, is what choice do we have? But then in terms of the Mount Panorama thing, um, don't forget, look, I mean, I thought exactly the same thing as you, I must say, and my heart sank. Um, uh, but, 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 but just one thing very quickly, Ed, it's, we, the Prime Minister is, is the narrow caster in chief. Hmm. He, is, uh, he is not necessarily a Prime Minister who is looking to build a big tent, although we could talk around that and trust, Ed, I think, hmm. today, a little with our figures, because the thing is, um, you know, the, the, the sort of opening year, particularly of the COVID response, we saw a little trust renaissance in this country, which was actually really important, which is now ebbed, unfortunately. But anyway, the Prime Minister narrow casts. It doesn't necessarily mean that uh, the, you know, uh, that every man in the country is now lining up, you know, to be to in the gender war on, on the other side of the fence. It doesn't mean that. It just means he speaks to voters whom he thinks he needs to speak to for whatever reason. And uh, Mount Panorama was a pretty obvious case in point. I don't know. It means, a, it means a little bit. It's like Julia Gillard, Pete. It, it's, it, you know, it's something, but it's not everything. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I was just going to comment um, that, to me, it's very consistent with how he's been as Prime Minister the whole way through. He's very blokey. I um, support the Cronulla Sharks and, you know, I'm a daggy dad. Like, that whole thing to me, that image seems projected primarily at, um, at blokes and even throughout the pandemic, all of the economic... Um, you know, the things were targeted at the construction in, in, uh, industry, anything with a hard hat, basically. Um, so to me, it read as consistent and that maybe with some bad polls, he was going back to that <laughs> base that he knows how to talk to. But um, that's interesting that we had a, a different take on that, I guess. Um, the other thing I was going to ask Pete before we go to questions um, was just reflecting on your column again and disinformation. I know you've got a new book out, The Public Square Project, yeah. but we're heading into an election. Um, it's currently still perfectly legal to lie in a political ad. Um, we've had revelations about Facebook and its engagement in democracies and other elections around the world being um, toxic, to say the least. Um, can you just talk to us a little bit about the role of disinformation, misinformation um, as we head into an election year, I guess. Yeah, and thanks for the product placement there. And um, thanks for the um, support of the Australia Institute in backing um, that book of essays, which will be great stocking filler um, if you've still got to fill a stocking people. Um, look, there's the notion that politicians will say or do anything to get elected but sitting side by side with the business models of the digital platforms, which are to give people what they already believe rather than anchor its algorithms to a fact base, um, to recognise that anger and division are more engaging and that's the way that you extract more behavioural data off the people using your network, creates a perfect storm where disinformation is not a... Um, it's not a it's not a glitch. It's actually a feature of the systems, right? They they run better when they're being driven by loud, angry voices. I guess the 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 bit I'll, I'll, I'll give you two quick things. The first is the, the the guys doing the research in disinformation up at QUT, Axel Bruns and Timothy Graham, who are just brilliant, track it, and what they find is often conspiracy theories start 
in this little online sort of wormhole, but they get turbocharged when they're repeated by people in the mainstream media, celebrities or leaders. So there is this relationship between traditional media candidates and the, it's, it's not just that the platforms are bad and while Morrison keeps going, I'm going to regulate the platforms, the platforms and that disinformation exist in relation to what our leaders are pushing out in the context of a campaign. Now, we've seen in these numbers the low levels of trust. I guess my quixotic um, plea at the end of this column would be a world in which the major parties effectively agreed to um, end the arms race in disinformation and um, committed to running campaigns that didn't go to 11. Now, I don't think that's going to happen, but it is, you can't regulate the platforms to um, create um, elections that are based on shared understandings and facts. That's actually up to the leaders, although you can do a few things. One thing you can do is um, ensure that um, the social media platforms comply to the same laws as traditional broadcasters in running political advertising. The second thing is, things like authorization, knowing where messages are coming from. At the moment, you've actually got to go and almost be a detective to try to work out what's going on because there is no transparency. Um, and finally, um, there's a blackout for the traditional media leading up to polling day, but not for the digital platforms. Like That just doesn't make any sense at all. So I do really um, support the work the broader institute's doing to... Um, to update um, our political um, advertising laws and bring truth in advertising. Um, but I, I guess my final point is that the platforms can't spread the disinformation if the politicians aren't putting it out in the first place. Yeah, um, I've got a question here from Alistair McCulloch, who says, how do you think Gladys standing for federal parliament with an ICAC inquiry hanging over her will play um, given she's already resigned from the New South yeah. Wales Parliament. Well, if you go to our poll, we've got yeah. that on slide nine. There, a uh, slide on that. Which is interesting. So, Pete, walk us through this. Uh, well, I reckon Morrison's been um, testing these messages. Like, it's the bottom line is New South Wales respondents. So, we, the Prime Minister has described New South Wales ICAC as a kangaroo court and suggested that Gladys was handed out of office. To what extent do you agree or disagree? In New South Wales, it's 42% agree and only 29% disagree with 29 in the middle. It's a bit less, but that's more in, in other states, but that's because the, um, the don't knows are much higher because it probably hasn't been as close to them. Um, quite remarkable. But as we know, this guy tests everything. Um, so don't think that he's made a mistake on this. This is calculated. And I think the prize is if he can land Gladys, she's got a better chance than others of winning back that independent seat. Mm, Catherine, is that your assessment? Mm, yeah, I, I think it's uh, it, it's certainly not. Um, look, look, it's, it's deeply disturbing, but let's just deal with this on a substantive level um, before we get into the, the practical implications. It is what, what the Prime Minister is doing and saying about a state-based anti-corruption body is deeply disturbing. I don't say that lightly. Uh, you know, we expect someone like Donald Trump to go to war with institutions in that way. Um, and and this, is, this is, he has extended a long way on taking on an institution uh, that, that has the sole purpose of basically trying to keep politics clean in, in a state where politics has not always been clean. So um, there's that. In terms of though the calculations, I agree with Pete. Uh, look, it's it's not like he's just suddenly lost the plot. He's he's made a he's made a decision, and I and most of his decisions are data based. Um, look, the the support for Berejiklian in in our in our question is not overwhelming, but but it, but it's there. Uh, and it's sort of consistent with um, a, a lot of conversations I've had with people in Sydney. Uh, there is a high degree of uh, sympathy for Gladys Berejiklian. and she was a very, you know, she was a person that the, vo the voters in New South Wales saw every day of the pandemic. So it's unsurprising that voters uh, in the state would have formed a relationship with a leader who was around at a seminal time. So 
it sort of all makes sense. But I can tell you for you know, people, <laughs> the view of Berejiklian from Canberra and from the rest of the country is quite different to the view of Berejiklian from Sydney. But anyway, putting that to one side, yes, I think the Prime Minister's made a calculation. Um, uh, and and it and it also tells you about the closeness of the contest. I think that's kind of what's revealing about it. The prime minister clearly thinks the liberals have to fight for every seat, and Warringah is a liberal seat. It's a, it's basically held by an independent because Zali Stegall beat Tony Abbott in 2019. But that is a liberal seat. The prime minister wants to restore a liberal seat to the liberal column because. At the moment, if we believe the published opinion polls, including our own, the content that Labor is ahead. Mm. Um, it's though it's I might probably... add, Catherine, the um, those community independents are running on three issues. They're running on climate, yeah. corruption, and women. Now he is leading with his chin a little bit if he looks up beyond Warringah, isn't he? Well, potentially, this is uh, the thing. Uh, look, I think you know, getting back to our sort of gender war. Tinderbox here. Um, I think there's. I think. It, I think this is tricky at a number of levels. But anyway, put that to one side. I did think when, when uh, Labor produced its uh, 2030 emissions reduction target late last week, and Morrison went immediately to war on it. Immediately to war. I did think. <laughs> I don't know how this is going to play in uh, Warringah and Wentworth and Goldstein. Goldstein. And these, it's sort of like it, 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 that doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me, right? It's it's sort of like you're trying to shore up votes in one part of the country, but you, you might end up losing seats that are in your heartland by your messaging. Um, so it's tricky. It's not easy. And, again, if we just sort of deal with the facts that are before us today, there is residual support for Berejiklian in New South Wales. It's not overwhelming, but it is present. And yes, it's it's very difficult. This is the, this is the art of elections. It's kind of like trying to get a result in one place that doesn't cost you in another place. And that's that's sort of what we're seeing at the moment. I think with the prime minister's positioning. Yeah, it is. I did. I was with you, Catherine. Found it really deeply disturbing those comments, though. For yeah, the simple reason that corruption is a big issue uh, and, and has been one seized on particularly by independents, but Labor and the Greens have, you know, been pretty strong on the need for a federal ICAC as well. And, um, yeah, that idea that that ICAC is fair game because it went after, you know, someone that the Prime Minister didn't agree with, like the 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 targeted attack and the kind of level of vitriol seem to have levelled up since his original comments, uh, which I do think is, is deeply uh, concerning for democracy. Um, that's here. the point. Yeah, that's what we're worried about here, democracy. Yeah, exactly. That's what we're worried about. Mm. Any of the politics. Um, the next question does relate to those voices of campaigns. It's from G Dean Tregenza, who says, will the rise of the voices campaigns by that, if anyone uh, isn't familiar, there's a whole range of independents who are cropping up um, across the country running voices for electorate name, voices for Indi, voices for Goldstein, those types of campaigns. Um, Will the rise of those voices of campaigns increase the likelihood of independence um, with enough seats to enable them to influence the legislative program for an ICAC on climate change and better transparency and all of those things? Pete, in terms of the seats where these are running, a lot of them are safe liberal seats. What are the prospects of some of these independents for a start? I honestly don't know. We do a national poll. Um... There are some robo polls going on that show them getting, you know, 20 to 30 percent. The campaigns haven't really started yet. I think there's two impacts. One is they create noise. They create a flank to the government's left they need to defend. And they are raising significant amounts of money with really credible candidates. Like this is not a Mickey Mouse operation. Um, for disclosure, I've done a bit of... Um, advisory work with Climate 200, which are the funders, just in terms of thinking through how this rolls out as well. However, I don't think we should look at these races as being necessarily progressive candidates. I think this is almost an internal fight within the Liberal Party for its future. Um, 
And I think a lot of those candidates probably look like what mainstream liberal candidates would have been if they'd got serious about gender equality the way Labor had 20 years ago. So I just, I'm a bit cautious about people getting too excited that this is sort of going to shift Australia progressive. I, I think if they were to hold a balance of power, it would be just as likely that they would first go to a coalition government and say, these are the three things you need to do to form government. And who knows, they're so hungry to hold power, maybe they go with that. Yeah, Catherine. Is that too cynical, Catherine? What were you going to ask me, Ed? Was... Oh, I, was, I was going to ask about the prospects for a minority parliament. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so I'll take, uh, take both of those. Too cynical for Pete and uh, prospects of minority parliament. Um, uh, no, not too cynical uh, in terms of the diagnostic, first of all. Um, look, like in stepping this through quickly, uh, look, this is a handful of seats phenomenon. As far as we're aware, we're not looking at some Emmanuel Macron style on March uprising here. This is a handful of seats that we're talking about. Uh, what sort of prospects have they got? I would think reasonable in a couple of these contests, but it does depend on the tone and tenor of the campaign. In terms of what they do in the event that Zali Stegel holds on and in the event she's joined by one colleague or, or, or more, um, well, I think Pete's diagnostic is right, and I said it. I, I said that in my in my Saturday column just gone. I think, uh, given the nature of these seats, uh, if these independents are elected, the the uh, desire of most of their constituents would be that they go to Scott Morrison and try and get a decent climate policy out of him and a decent commitment on an integrity commission. That that would be their default. Uh, obviously, in the event that uh, that doesn't occur, well, then it's anybody's ball game. And in terms of, uh, you know, that, that, that obviously has an impact. That's that's quite significant. If uh, if the crossbench is in a position after this election to get a better climate policy, um, you know, great. Um, but in terms of will that happen? Um, Look, certainly serious people on both sides in the major party fraternity do think what they're looking at is a hung parliament. That is a likely scenario. Uh, certainly if the election were held tomorrow, that would be where a bulk of people would think that the election would end in a hung parliament. Uh, what happens next year, though, that's, that's sort of anyone's guess. We've got a, a sort of Christmas period to get through uh, we've we've got twists and turns in the pandemic. We've got does the parliament return or not? If it returns, can you know, Morrison control it? Produce a budget? Give himself you know a bit more oomph for a campaign? There's a few variables really that. Uh, so I mean, the short answer is yes. I think I think a minority parliament today, as we're talking, is entirely possible. Next year, we'll see. Yeah. Um, Pete, coming back to you, um, I guess I wanted to ask about, there's a couple of people in here asking about uh, Clive Palmer in the election, and maybe this one's for you as well, Catherine, um, but he is running again. Uh, it strikes me that his message is quite different this time around. He seems to be much more, last time, all of Palmer's advertising was really directed at um, taking down Bill Shorten. This time it seems much more directed at the government, vaccine mandates, that type of thing. What impact do you think he'll have in the next election? Yeah, it's another one where I don't know. Um, if he followed the playbook of last time, this incredible amount of money, and they're, they're outspending, UAP is outspending um, the major parties on social media by a factor of about 100 to 1 at the moment. It's, it's just amazing. Um, so there's a wall of noise um, of the yellow ads. Um, what happened last time was they swung into being negative shortened ads in the last four weeks of the campaign and reinforced the coalition message that Bill was too big a risk. Now, can they? the, the attack this time is different. The, the attack this time is against all government for lockdowns and attacks on freedom. Um, will they then swing behind the Morrison government at the 11th hour? I don't know. I, I'm not sure it's not going to be more like 2016 when both One Nation, um, I can't remember if Palmer did or not, but One Nation preferenced against sitting MPs and that actually did work to Labor's advantage. So 
Well, we will see. What what is for sure is that they create a lot of noise and they do have, you know, we saw in those earlier numbers, 8% of people won't get vaccinated, another eight, you know, 10% on top of that are against measures that um in that freedom frame of putting obligations on people who haven't got vaccinated. So there is a sizable rump that could um, be influenced by whatever their closing message is. But that's one group I'm not working for. So I can't tell you what their closing <laughs> message is going to be at this point. Um, Catherine, did you have any comments on that? It was fairly kind of big spend last election. Yeah, well, when Pete was flagging uh, regulations for the platforms. Um, and regulations in the sort of election context, I think, you know, one of the, <laughs> a very good regulation to consider would be a cap on spending um, during elections, because, uh, I mean, obviously it's constitutionally difficult, but, uh, you know, there is this phenomenon where high wealth individuals of any stripe um, can decide if so motivated to outspend uh, any of the political parties uh, sort of contesting for um, representation on the landscape. I, I think that's actually a significant issue as somebody who quite likes democracy. Um, <laughs> anyway, uh, putting that to one side, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure either. Certainly they are going into the campaign, uh, the, the UAP uh, in a pox on both your houses mode, but they are very nimble. If we look at their uh, advertising Sort of messaging and tactics from 2019. It's not only volume; it's also they're, they're also quick. They move quickly. Uh, what happened in 2019 was uh, the sort of anti-shorten messaging really crystallised in the final two weeks of the campaign. Um, so it, I, I'm not in the business of predicting what Clive Palmer does, but certainly uh, the government is worried. The government has been worried for months which is part of the reason why you've seen the Prime Minister's messaging changing around some of the pandemic, um, well, around his record in the, in the pandemic. Bizarrely, we've seen the Prime Minister pit himself against his own record in the pandemic periodically in order to try and scoop up these voters. So it's a real thing. Um, we're going to have to go shortly, but I did just want to throw up, this is what the cover of Pete's book. Oh, thank you. Square Project. It's available in all good bookstores. I got mine at Paper Chain in Monica. Uh, it's a great read. It'll be an excellent stocking stuffer, as Pete said, but it's also on the Australia Institute's essential reading list for 2021. So you can head on over to australiainstitute.org.au to find that as well as a Conababble, Richard Dennis's book, and The Nordic Edge, to which I contributed a chapter. Uh, we've had a big year for books at the Australia Institute and another one coming up next year. Um, but don't forget to head on over to Guardian Australia and check out the results of today's Guardian Essential poll, as well as Pete's column uh, that you can find over there. And I just want to thank again all of the audience for joining us on this journey this year. Um, we get, you know, close to a thousand people come and discuss politics every fortnight um, in a really in-depth manner. And I just find it so encouraging, even when everything is a bit awful, uh, to come here and know that people are so engaged. So we appreciate that you've been here with us all year. We hope you'll join us again next year. And thank you, Catherine and Pete, for a marvellous year. I can't believe we made it. <laughs> <laughs> Neither can I. Thank you. Thank you too, Ed, for, uh, for wonderful facilitation. So thank you. Yeah, indeed. And thanks to all the work of the Australia Institute. And um, thanks to the, like, it's, a, it's a good triad, isn't it? The Australia yeah. Institute, The Guardian and Essential. We, we, we support each other and it's been yeah, it's been a very uh, a very good year and um, great to have um, access to this kind of analysis. So thanks again, everyone. Take care over summer. Don't forget to check out our essential reading list. Lots of great ideas for Christmas tips or if you're like me, just books to read. Not that I'll probably be going to the beach with the weather at the moment, but good books to sit down with um, while you've got a bit of a break. I hope you all have a wonderful break, uh, Catherine and Pete included, because I think it's going to be a rip snorter of a year next year. <laughs> so uh, we've got to gird our loins for an election year. Yeah. But thank you so much. Um, and we'll see everyone next year. All right. Everyone, take care.